Welcome to Day Zero Update for October 6, 2024. I'm your host, Chris Sologi. And I'm Brandon Perkins. And yeah, it's, uh, I'd say not been a busy week of news. Mm-hmm. Not really a ton here. A bunch of uh, stupid news, developer news, uh, things like that. Uh, but not really much. And we have game news, which I guess could be a sign that we have hit the tipping point of developers needing to announce dates for things that are happening yeah. uh, for this fall. So that uh, now they need to kind of shut up and put out their games, which... Yeah, seriously. They are doing that uh, for the most mm-hmm. part. Um got some subscription news and such but before we get to uh all this news here we'll be talking about what we've been playing and i'll kick it off here uh the new game i got this week was a uh, pinball spire mm-hmm. uh, this is a game that's only on steam right now or on pc it's on steam and like gog and a couple other services maybe um uh, but it is a pinball vania as they describe mm-hmm. themselves um and it kind of adheres more to the uh, kind of design sensibilities of pinball tables mm-hmm. than, say, the other big game in that genre, which is uh, Yoku's Island Express, mm. uh, which kind of had the more of a vibe of like a a regular, uh, you know, one of those kind of games, mm. uh, Metroid or Castlevania kind of game, um, but that the mechanic for getting around was pinball. Mm-hmm. Um, especially as you there, you controlled a beetle that had a uh, big ball strap, you know, chained to it. Um, mm-hmm. You could push around and do that kind of stuff. Here, uh, you are um, controlling all the uh, paddles and uh, such that are in these various parts of this spire. Mm. Um, you come in initially to uh, get your first uh, ability, which is sort of a focus ability that lets you. Slow things down so you can better aim shots mm. uh, for specific areas. Uh, though they do have a tr- uh, an achievement that is basically to beat the game without using that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that might be something I do uh, later as like an extra challenge thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, for now, it's not really been um, a thing that I really want to do. But mm. uh, otherwise, um, where I'm at, I am... A bit further into the game, maybe halfway or so. I don't think this is a super long game, maybe four or five hours. Yeah. Um, I'm at a weird place where I am trying to uh, get the get the ball into these specific areas um, mm-hmm. in this puzzle, in this, uh, this room that I would say is maybe the first like big room in the game. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so much so that it kind of causes the the frame rate to dip if I try to zoom out mm. all the way to see the whole room. Um, and nicely, they have um, some accessibility options, like you can zoom in and out uh, to kind of frame it better for how you want it to be framed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has a uh, option. I think you put push in like the the L three button that pulls up a pointer that you can highlight different parts of the um the 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 room and sort of see like okay mm. this is this is a spinner here this is uh a switch i need to hit to uh affect some other part of the level or this is how i unlock the uh letters uh that kind of stuff and so that's mm. uh very useful for being able to parse some of these rooms because otherwise if you're just going in just doing pinball stuff you will either just be wasting time sitting there um, in the ball around uh, before you figure out like, Oh, mm-hmm. okay. So I have to hit it up here to the second set of, uh, uh, of uh, bumpers um, uh, or flippers that uh, uh, has like a second area that mm-hmm. then you need to hit it out this other area, uh, this path that goes to a separate screen, which then, well, as you kind of come back through a different path, uh, they they like to do some of those kind of uh, situations where mm-hmm. you have to leave the 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 room to go to a different area that then has a, a switch or something over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes it's it's like you approach a room that you need an ability that you don't have yet, and so you kind of mm-hmm. make a side path that goes to 
an area where you can uh, get that ability, uh, which works out pretty well. Kind of keeps the game moving pretty quickly uh, for for what I've been playing so far. I'm about mm. like two and a half hours in, and uh, dealing with the room, there's just kind of got a lot going on that I'm trying to parse and figure out, um, especially because it has a tricky area um, right below it. Uh, mm. So that if I I uh, mess up and let the ball kind of fall between the flippers or um, around the sides of the flippers. Mm. Um, I have to go through this like tricky area that requires either just your luck from trying to guess the right time to mm. um, hit the ball up because there's these uh, little like piston things pushing um, uh, little platforms from the sides that blocks your your path upward. So the first time I've had anything like that be uh, a part of the um, the design for these areas, so mm. uh, that's been a bit frustrating. And um, the only other real issue I've had is I've uh, you have a mana bar for all your abilities that refills as you hit like enemies and such. Mm. I've gotten stuck in a particular area because the uh, uh, the ball managed to get into an area that it could not get out of mm. uh, naturally that required. Uh, one of my other abilities that was not usable and it doesn't have as far as I could see any sort of reset of the ball um, that can maybe move it to uh, a nearby area um, mm. uh, that was disappointing but luckily I had a recent save so uh, in sort of a metroid kind of fashion there are save rooms um, that are all designed the same when you get to them uh, so uh, that's pretty nice to mix it easy to know like when they're segmenting areas Mm -hmm. uh, for you so there's not really there's not really much uh, exploration in the way that's like the the regular kind of games in this genre would be doing Mm -hmm. kind of generally progressing upward Um, and as you go you get these save rooms that kind of segment it like all right, you probably don't need to go down anymore but maybe they'll in uh add some sort of new area of a reason to leave, but so far that's not been an issue so far, but yeah, enjoying it a lot so far. Um, I believe it's like 15 bucks. So pretty solid price for what it is. Mm. Uh, looking forward to playing some more of that, but yeah, that's pinball spire. Um, the other game I got this week, um, that's been out for a bit on PC, but is out on consoles for the first time mm-hmm. is crypt master. Uh, this is a dungeon crawler where um, you have the crypt master kind of hanging around, uh, watching what you're doing as you're uh, going around. You get this crew of four uh, characters, um, mm. and they're like classic fantasy archetypes of a mm. a warrior, uh, a mage, um, a thief, and a uh, I forget what the last one would be. Um, be a wizard i guess i don't know but yeah. um the the main way you're interacting uh besides moving around which requires the arrow keys on a keyboard mm. uh, for the pc version um because you're typing for much of it as you can type things that the the crypt master will respond to um often i just be like what the heck are you talking about mm. you're just typing nonsense into the into there um and you can't really type like questions or anything uh it's you know solid you know one word mm-hmm. um, so it's there's not really much opportunity for uh any sort of questions or uh anything like that um which is a, a little bit weird to get used to uh initially especially as they get some opportunities where i wanted to tell them to shut up but that's two words, not one. So that was kind of a uh, an issue, but yeah, um, Crypt Master, you're kind of uh, moving along the uh, uh, these levels. Uh, so far, I'm on the second uh, tier of levels, uh, which involves the the bone houses and swamps and some other areas. I'm trying to get around in, and uh, with combat, you are uh, typing out the abilities that your characters have uh, with uh, 
the ability to push one, two, three, and four to see which available abilities they have. Um, uh, because as you're moving around, they have a little kind of the Wheel of Fortune esque kind of uh, series of bases for a potential new ability or spell that they can learn, but you may not know uh, necessarily what that word is. Uh, so as you're defeating enemies, you think get a choice of like, oh, uh, pick one of these words or letters in this word uh, that you want to reveal on everybody's uh, uh, next ability uh, thing, and it'll uh, fill in those spots if it has it. Um, where I'm at, I'm usually getting two letters uh, that are next to each other, so I'm trying to pick out um, ones that hopefully will reveal stuff. And yeah, as you uh, reveal more letters, you can try and guess, uh, type in guesses for what those are. Uh, and you might get some basic stuff like a, a for your mage, a zap or an electric attack. Uh, uh, you get for uh, your mage, like a, uh, an ability, a healing ability called Soothe. And the way that their health is um, set up is that the, the three or four letters of their name is three or four bars of health. Uh, so as they take hits, and I think it's generally random from the uh, the way battles go. Um, uh, if they take, you know, three if their name is three letters long or four if they're four letters long, uh, then they die and you have to go find a save point to save at and sort of bring them back to life. I assume I might get an ability that might do that at some point. But during combats, the abilities you use uh, require a cooldown timer uh, before you know each character is able to use another ability. And you might run into enemies that are like, have a shield that's like, oh, this one blocks all words with E in it. So you're like, well, I can't use hit uh, because that has a T in it. So I would have to use um, a different ability or... Yeah, and uh, maybe a character just has T words in it. So it's like, well, that character is out for now, so I'll have to use the other ones and use words that I know that don't have a T in it, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's a, a pretty cool little twist they put into the, the combat that works out pretty well. Um, and yeah, this, uh, this game is pretty cool, especially when you get to um, a lot of the interaction with the Crypt Master because. Uh, the way it might seem is might seem like this game is uh, using generative AI in some form, but it's not. It is using mm. just uh, a lot of writing mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, various potential words you could put in there. Yeah, um, and he'll ignore stuff too. So uh, that's how they deal with a lot of like nonsense or just calling whatever you're typing in nonsense. Though I did type in poop once, and he just shut down the game is like I've heard a lot of vile words before but this one takes the cake kind of thing uh, that was a pretty funny uh, bit there uh, and also if you type fart you see a bunch of like specks of poop you know fly across the screen as you hear a fart so yeah. they know kind of what they're doing with the, uh, some of the more uh, colorful words you could be using I've not really typed in any curse words but um, I did find a character that Enjoy that uh, uh, kind of stuff, typing poop and butthole at them, mm. all that kind of stuff. So uh, there's some fun to be had with uh, just typing in uh, more curse, cursing kind of song, uh, uh, words in it. So mm. um, it's a pretty cool game. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's got a lot of cool stuff in it. I am stuck a little bit where I've taken on a side quest trying to find this uh, rat uh, kid who is lost in the, the swamps, but I've gone through all the swamps as far as I could tell and have not seen any sort of uh, rat kid. Um, so uh, kind of stuck a little bit in my look up a guide and see kind of what I'm doing wrong uh, yeah. for that stuff. But uh, yeah, it has some uh, some pretty cool vibes to it. Definitely worth checking out. I believe on the console versions, they may not have keyboard support yet, but I believe they have voice support. Yeah. Uh, to work pretty well in the PS5 as you got the the mic on the controller itself. 
Mm. Um, but I have not tested any of that stuff out yet. Uh, they have that in the PC version, but I just didn't want to get it set up. It also requires you to turn on some setting in the Windows options uh, for that stuff. So I've not done any of that. Just kind of focused on the the typing, but um, I mentioned typing on the controller is probably just fine since it's not it's not too much of a um, hectic game. The the battles are not all that uh, hectic or anything. So yeah. But yeah, that's Crypt Master. That's uh, out now. I believe that's like twenty five bucks, mm. uh, full price. But I managed to get it on uh, Green Man Gaming for a bit cheaper. Mm. Uh, so that's uh, the way that I went. But yeah, that's a that's a cool one of those games. If you like your uh, kind of uh, dungeon crawling games with a bit more uh, fun thought to it, with the key, uh, the typing stuff to it, so. Uh, that one's cool. Um, also been playing some Assassin's Creed Brotherhood because I've just had an itch for uh, jumping back into that game um, uh, because it's one of the more interesting early Assassin's Creed games as they kind of brought a lot of more idle elements as you're kind of buying up all these businesses in Rome uh, early on and expanding your influence in the city i've gotten to uh done a few more story missions so now i'm about to start uh doing business with the uh the guilds uh, the mercenaries the thieves and the uh i believe the um arlequins i don't i don't know what the specific word they use for the the ladies that run the brothels um uh, that kind of stuff so looking forward to checking out more of that but Kind of playing this reminded me how much uh, these old Assassin's Creed games were very much bad stealth games because mm-hmm. uh, you can kill kill enemies and nobody around will really notice it. Mm. Um, even if you throw the bodies near them, uh, the characters might react a little bit, but it's not like a a Hitman game or something more recent that uh, where you'll send all the enemies into a state of uh, you know, search for whoever did this. Um, I was in this area around a Borgia Tower. I just had a bunch of enemies around to kill, and, like, I could just kill the ones in each uh, section and just move on. Nothing happened, uh, alerting the, anybody else. Uh, it was just kind of wild. Uh, the one weird time is where I went down under this area to mm-hmm. get the captain. Uh, uh, though I... In my... Haste of trying to take them out, I alerted like a bunch of people, like eight mm. to ten uh, soldiers. Uh, managed to take them out. The captain got away, but then like, oh, there's a new ship. The captain has respawned. I was like, oh, I just killed everybody that would be down here. So I just walked up to him and stuck him with the hidden blade, and it's like, all right, that was easy. Uh, there's a lot of like that kind of stuff to this game where it's not really built in an eloquent way to react to the things you're doing. Mm. So if you just go and kill everybody, it'll make your uh, your goals usually easier. Uh, sometimes it'll make them a little bit more challenging, um, especially when the, the captain gets away and it's like, oh, you have to wait for the next shift. And it gives you no idea of when that is. Uh, but yeah, it's it's still a pretty solid game. But yeah, there's a lot of frustrating control stuff that got better with each new game. Um the combat stuff is pretty decent mm-hmm. uh, in hindsight at this point, but uh, yeah, it's uh, still a pretty solid game. And uh, the other game I'm playing is UFO 50, jumping in and uh, playing a bunch of the stuff in there. Um, uh, just trying out some of the new games. There's a Campanella game that you play early on that is kind of an arcadey game where you're controlling this spaceship, uh, which shows up in a bunch of the games uh, and is the influence for the name of uh, the developer at a certain point, they change their names to UFO soft mm. um, in the, in the game. And that is sort of a major character um, pilot quest. The ship that you crash is that is that ship. Um, but in Campanella, you're, you're controlling this ship almost in like a, a lunar lander kind of way. Mm. Um, but you have an attack uh, on the, the other side of you, which way you're facing and you're popping, you know, balloons and 
uh, enemies and such and getting points for that as you go around uh, and you find the exit point for the for the current room to go to the next one and and just keep doing that as you're getting a higher score. Um, you do have fuel that isn't a big deal early on, um, uh, but they do start including some refueling stations uh, to help you kind of refuel if that is an issue. Mm. Um, that one's just purely going for high score. Uh, but then they make a sequel later on uh, that is that kind of idea, but mixed with uh, like a blaster master uh, where you control a person outside of the ship. And then you sort of run up and get in and use that to attack enemies in a similar way. Um, but as you land, your character pops out again, that can shoot uh, on their own Um uh, it's a very tough game because your character cannot really uh, drop too far and survive uh, on jumps. And uh, once you uh, run out of health on your ship, uh, you get a game over. Uh, so I've been trying to play that and usually do not last more than a few minutes in it. As uh, the, the other thing is they randomly generate the... Uh, the map that you're in. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, the things you're trying to collect, there's like stars you're collecting, uh, coins, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, As you're trying to take out enemies and find, you know, uh, places to explore, all that kind of stuff. And it's pretty cool and pretty interesting to see how they would have um, iterated on that idea. Uh, But yeah, that game, very tough to get a grab on uh grapple on so yeah but uh that's been pretty much what i've been doing so how about you brandon what have you been doing well uh the primary game i've been playing uh right now because i'm in the process of reviewing it is renatus uh this is a action rpg from nis and um it's okay is how I'll put it. There's parts of this game that I really like, and there's parts of this game that I just cannot stand. Um, The basic sort of premise of the game is that you're in a sort of alternate world that's essentially ours, except that magic is real. And in this case, the way people get access to magic is, well, they have a couple of different ways. Uh, there's people who are like have a long lineage of being wizards, and they're then they're literally called wizards in the game. By the way, uh, uh, there's others who are called what are called replicas, and these are basically people who experience like a near death experience, and after they wake up, they suddenly discover that they actually have magic. Um, and then there's a third way, which involves a drug that is called rub rum. Uh, that's literally what it's called. It's stupid, I know, but and basically, it allows anyone who takes it to be able to use magic for a short period of time. The only problem is, it's as you can imagine, extremely addictive, and it eventually turns the user into a monster at some point. Um, so, the actual game, um, you're it's essentially divided up between. Well, at first, it's at least the first half of it. Uh, it's divided up between two different storylines. One is about this woman who is a member of the MEA, which is the Magical Enforcement Agency. Basically, it's the police force that uh, polices magic users. And basically, if you are found using magic, they either try to get you to uh, join the police force so they can control you, or they'll just end up killing you outright. Um and then there's another one who's a guy who's known as a stray, which is a uh, magic user who refuses to sort of pick sides in the sort of conflict that's going on. Uh, essentially, there are two major factions in this game. There's the MEA, like I previously mentioned, and then there's the guild. And the guild is essentially a like uh, a sort of like a wizard terrorist organization that... Uh, sort of they mostly live in this place called another which is like a sort of a a different dimension um and it's sort of like an area that you go into a bunch of times during the game up until this point um 
because it's 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 not important. Uh, it's another plot line, but um, basically the game is a um, it's like I said, it's divided into two parts at least at first, and the the game sort of reacts to uh, what your position is in the world any particular time you're having to fight. Because every so often you'll either have to go up against Rubromatics, which are called the Damned in the game, or you'll have to go up against uh, members of the MEA, or you'll have to go up against monsters, or on occasion you'll have to go up against members of these guys called the City Watch, which are basically just a uh, government-sanctioned vigilante group that goes around beating up random people. Um, and the thing is, because you're a wizard and because magic is heavily regulated, uh, if you are not a member of the MEA, you have to be really careful when you bring out your magic and then have to essentially go into hiding immediately afterwards. Um, if you use it when you're playing, you know, the Stray storyline, um, everyone else in the street will immediately start, like, bringing out their phones and everything and it'll start going on social media and eventually once it reaches number one on trending that's when the mea will show up and try to kill you so you either have to leave the immediate area and go to another nearby area or you have to go into these hiding places that are occasionally sort of sprinkled around the various parts of shibuya where this game takes place um but if you're playing the uh the woman's storyline because she's an MEA officer, she can use her magic whenever she wants um, and not have to deal with, you know, getting, having to deal with a crackdown or anything. That said, however, your magic is always sort of limited. Um, there's a meter that you have to watch when you're using magic because it slowly drains as you use magical attacks. Once it drains, you then have to either wait for it to refill or you have to use a... Uh, what's called the magic circle mechanic where you then have to drain magic from whatever enemy you're going up against. Um, and this particular mechanic is a little finicky because, uh, you know, unless you are like completely drained of magic and your meter is in the red, there's like a weird timing thing you have to do where you have to like press the button to trigger it. And then you have to wait and press it again when the circle is like completely filled up. Um, if it's in the red, it automatically happens when you're attacked, but otherwise it can be weirdly finicky. Um, the other parts of this game, like it's a kind of a, kind of a cliche premise, but as far as like the writing is concerned, they actually do a fairly decent job of it. There's a lot of like sort of moral grayness with like whatever faction you're involved in. Uh, the MEA is eventually shown to be like this very sort of self-serving authoritarian agency that doesn't really care about the people underneath its command. But the guild is shown to basically be essentially completely run by like legacy wizards who look down upon and abuse the replicas who end up joining the guild. Um, and there's also like the subject of where all of the rubber on drug is coming from. Um, and eventually halfway through what happens is uh, the uh, characters, essentially the two storylines end up meeting up because there's an incident that happens where the MEA characters you've been playing are forced to go on the run. And so they have to join up with the other group, uh, the stray group, in order to uh, deal with a overall thing. Um, the combat is, it's all right. Um, it's very button mashy, but it can be pretty satisfying at times, uh, depending on what character you're playing. Um, there's like basically every uh, group party in the game has like, you know, the one character that's like a bruise, that's like a sort of a fast fighter. There's another one that's like a bruiser. And then there's another one who does sort of like kind of like projectile like attacks. Um, the bruiser ones can be fairly slow but they are necessary because occasionally you'll go up against enemies who have like armor and you have to like break the armor before you can actually start fighting them. Um, the other major issue with this game is the character models. The character models in this game do not emote at all. Like period. They do not. They sometimes they don't even blink. 
and it is really noticeable at times because sometimes they'll go into like really emotional dialogue and the voice, you know, the voice acting is obviously trying to really sell it, but the graphics just aren't doing it because the character models basically look like R- Bunraku puppets. It's really bizarre. Um, but yeah, that's Renatus. Um, but other than that, I've also been playing uh, the demo for Metaphor Refantasio, which I am definitely going to be getting when it comes out Friday. Um, yeah, that game is... It's amazing. Um, first and foremost, they don't even try to hide the fact that even though this game is supposed to be completely separate from the Persona series, uh, the guts are still Persona. Like, there's even a mechanic called the Archetypes mechanic that's almost cut and paste the Persona mechanic. There's even uh, their equivalent to the Velvet Room, which even looks like the Velvet Room, or at least a version of the Velvet Room, with the exception that Igor is not the one in control of it. Uh, There's this other person. Um, But other than that, the actual, like, world building they've managed to do for this is shockingly original. especially when it comes to a JRPG. Like, let's be honest, with a lot of JRPGs, the world building has been extremely generic. Um, It's sort of the same, you know, cliches and tropes done over and over again. In this case, they managed to basically uh, avoid all of them. Um, The basic plot of the game is is that there's this uh, country, this kingdom... Uh, that is essentially uh, united with all of these different tribes. And there aren't any equivalents to like your elves or your orcs or dwarves or anything like that. The closest thing you've got to elves in this game uh, are essentially the, they got like the long knife ears, but they aren't like the, you know, the lanky, delicate feet elves. They're basically the closest this game's equivalent is to orcs being like the proud warrior race group. Um, and there's an even there's even another uh, tribe that has even shorter knife ears, and they're even bigger and stronger than the previous ones. Um, there's also another one that is uh, pretty much the closest this game has anything to regular humans that have like these little horns growing out of their head. Uh, there's also a group that have like dog ears. There's another one that has um, uh, wings growing out of their back. There's another one that has like a third eye. Um, that walks around with these like enormous sort of uh, boxy masks on their heads. Um, And then there's you, the player character, who's a member of a group called the Elda. Uh, And the Elda are sort of, uh, sort of mid uh, height humanoids with somewhat darker skin who also have uh, two different colored eyes, wherever they are. And they're extremely small. They're nomadic. Uh, They tend to, um, you know, live in fairly uh, closed off villages and they're regularly discriminated against wherever you go because the ruling church uh, in this universe, the Sanctus Church, uh, says that they have a kind of uncontrollable magic power that endangers everyone around them. And that's the one of the groups you're playing. Uh, and the essential plot is uh, the uh, king of this particular uh kingdom is dead he has been murdered assassinated in his bed uh by this guy named luis and it's not it's not like a it's not like a spoiler or anything because it literally happens in the first 10 minutes of the of the game um you see him do it um and basically what's happening is luis is like this former military leader who is slowly starting to gather followers around himself because he wants to overthrow the kingdom and make himself essentially the new ruler um and what happens though is you as the player you've been care- playing as uh you are a former friend of a you are the friend of the prince the son of the king who's been assassinated but for the last 10 years he the prince has been suffering from this curse that was inflicted upon him when he was a child uh by a group that were trying to assassinate the king years earlier and by the time the gang starts the curse has proceeded to the point where he's now effectively in a coma um and in order to 
uh, lift the curse, you basically have to try and kill the ones responsible. And they believe that Louis, Louise is one of the people responsible for it. Um, but while they're trying to kill Louise, the uh, spirits, I mean, that at least that's what the game uh, seems to imply, of the king returns in a matter of speaking, and declares the creation of what he calls the tournament, where basically the various candidates for the king for uh, the crown that are considered to be the most you know supported amongst the peoples of the kingdom have to essentially over the next I think it's like a I can't I, I think it's like a year or something like that they have to travel around the kingdom trying to get alliances and drum up support so that when the time is over whoever has the most support ends up being crowned king. Um, but off the very beginning, there's already a lot of weird stuff that's happening in this game. First and foremost is the fact that, uh, our world is actually acknowledged in this game, like our world, the real world, but it's through a fantasy novel. They literally call it a fantasy novel in the, in the game. Uh, it's a book that's written by this guy named Moore, uh, who is the guy that runs this game's equivalent of the Velvet Room. And essentially, it's an idealized ver uh, vision of our world, where there's only one tribe of people, the human race, everybody is equal, and they have industry and stuff, so they have a lot of technological marvels. It's obviously very idealized, but it's how they see us. That's part one. The other weird part are the humans. There is actually a group called humans in this game, but they aren't us. They are these enormous horrifying chimeric abominations um that are heavily inspired by the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch and they definitely look like it um i i and if you don't know who Hieronymus Bosch is just look at the enemies in this game and then look up the name you'll definitely see it um the fact that they're called humans first of all is like okay why particularly that name um, and second of all, they seem to be growing. There's more of them every day. Nobody knows where they're coming from. So I'm expecting some real like storytelling twists and turns in this game. Um, also the soundtrack is amazing. And, uh, I talked more about it for, uh, the let's weekend. If you want to go back and listen to that. I'm not going to spoil everything today because it's an amazing demo and looks like it's going to be an amazing game. So yeah, that's what I've been playing. All right. So yeah, let's get to some news. And mm -hmm. uh, first up here, we've got some subscription news, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for game pass as uh, they have uh, announced their slate here for the first uh, couple of weeks of October. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's see here uh, for October 2nd. Okay, it seems like they've announced a couple of things for Game Pass Standard tier. Mm -hmm. uh, and will be the show 24 for console and Open Roads mm. uh, for console. So if you have Game Pass Standard, uh, you can check those games out now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there you go. Um, let's see, October 2nd also had Sifu uh, for console and PC. Uh, I like they have to mention which tiers so that you know uh, what's up? Uh, so Game Pass Ultimate, PC Game Pass, and Game Pass Standard get access to Sifu. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very cool game. So that's one we're checking out. If you like your uh, kind of uh, action games with uh, uh, a focus on sort of kung fu style combat uh, stuff going on, so that's one that mm -hmm. is worth checking out. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Available tomorrow, October seventh. Bad Streets. Uh, for console and PC, for Ultimate, PC Game Pass, and Game Pass Standard. Uh, Physics-based party game. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, looks like a yeah, brawler kind of action game of sorts, mm -hmm. but party-based. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, that's cool. Um, and let's see, for October 10th, there's Inscription for console and PC. Mm. On Game Pass Ultimate, PC Game Pass, and Game Pass Standard. Uh, that's a game that was highly regarded uh, mm. last year, year before. I forget which year it was. Um, uh, it's a really cool kind of deck building roguelike uh, with some escape room style puzzles and some spooky 
mm. uh, psychological horror stuff kind of going on in there. Um, a lot of like fourth wall uh, stuff to it as well. So that's worth mm. checking out. And yeah, here the the Game Pass stuff they announced uh, at their little TGS show. Um, yeah, all you need is help. That is out now on Ultimate and PC Game Pass. Mm. Legend of Mana uh, for Ultimate and PC Game Pass. Trials of Mana for uh, Ultimate PC Game Pass, and then we love Katamari Reroll plus Royal Reverie for console and PC on Ultimate PC Game Pass and Game Pass Standard. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can check out those games if you have not played them before. Um, but yeah, that seems like the the Game Pass stuff. So uh, mm. some solid stuff there. Uh, mm. But yeah, then we got the uh, the Nintendo Switch Online update for. The expansion pass, as there's two new GBA games coming to uh, the GBA app, uh, both mm. of them F Zero games. Yep. Uh, the two F Zero games they put out, F Zero GP Legend and F Zero Climax. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess uh, Climax did not release anywhere else. I don't um, think it's in Japan. Yeah, and then uh, GP Legend, which I believe was based on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, believe it or not, they had a anime. I guess uh, they got. Brought over. I'm going to take a wild guess that it was on the, uh, uh, the Fox thing, mm. um, with the the shitty localizations. I could be wrong, but, um, yeah. So that's cool. Um, I have two copies of that game because it was on sale for cheap, fairly often, and I forgot I forgot I had a a copy mm. already when I got it the second time. All right. Uh, so that's a that's a whole thing. I double check about the show. Oh, there's an easy way to find it. Um, yeah, there's the anime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, F Zero GP Legend. Yep, fifty one episode animated adaptation of the video game series. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Four Kids Entertainment brought it over to North America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and was modified by Four Kids. 15 episodes aired on Foxbox channel in the U.S. before its cancellation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wonder if that's uh, been released fully anywhere else. Is just mm-hmm. uh, a regular show without the four kids uh, crap in there. But mm-hmm. I remember that being a pretty decent show. But yeah, that's that's around when uh, Nintendo stopped caring about F Zero. Yeah. So there you go experience uh, some of the last games that they put out in that franchise mm-hmm. uh, but let's see here yeah Paramount has some mm-hmm. game news uh, they have licensed out the Avatar The Last Airbender IP mm-hmm. to Saber Interactive mm-hmm. uh, to make what they call an action RPG a big budget one mm-hmm. uh, that they are working on uh, so that's kind of neat mm-hmm. uh, I guess what they call the Avatar Legends universe yeah, I guess because it also includes Legend of Korra. So, mm-hmm. uh, that's cool. Yeah, that actually sounds really neat. I, I hope it turns out. I hope it turns out good, because uh, you know the, the video game adaptations for this series have been pretty mid at best. Yeah, um, as a lot of games were back in the, uh, like Xbox 360 era. Mm-hmm. Especially the infamous one where, uh. You can get a thousand points pretty quickly, which I believe I heard was because uh, the uh, achievement list they came up with was rejected at the last minute, so they just had to come with come up with something last minute to do uh, for that game, and that ended up being what came out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but hey, people bought that game because they get an easy thousand points. Mm. So that seems like a a solid compromise there for them, but yeah, hopefully this one will be a bit better of a game, and at least have the beat the bar of the the big live action movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, a low bar, but it's kind of what this franchise is for the most part. Um, but yeah, there's that. Um, and yeah, we've got some rumors swirling about Ubisoft uh, as shareholders have been complaining that they should go private or. Uh, sell themselves off or something. It seems like potentially uh, the deal that is in the early stages is that Tencent might be um, buying out uh, Ubisoft from the Guillermo family. Mm-hmm. 
uh, which certainly would be a way to go, I guess. Um, oh. Ubisoft is not necessarily a hugely um, like great purchase because they have a ton of people, like tens of thousands of people, mm-hmm. and do not necessarily produce a huge amount of revenue uh, for that amount of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think their their current uh, market cap is at like one point five billion dollars. Mm. After shares have fallen fifty four percent so far this year, mm-hmm. uh, which means they would be worth about a third of what uh, Disney paid for Star Wars or Marvel mm. as a whole. Yeah, um, that's like half of what that's uh, Bungie cost mm-hmm. Tony. So that's kind of wild for a company of their stature with all the uh, interesting IPs and such that they have had. Yeah. Uh, but the releases for the past few years have not been what we would call substantial. Or solid. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had like a number of licensed games that did not uh, do huge numbers. Um, no. Uh, their best game this year is the Prince of Persia game, which also did not do huge numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it was a bit overpriced at 40 bucks, but also, as anybody knows, if you wait long enough, Ubisoft games are real cheap. Yep. Uh, There's no reason to buy one of their games at launch if you are not uh, sold on it right away. Mm -hmm. Uh, You end up with a $10 copy of uh, Balls and Bones. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's uh, kind of the problem they've been in. Um, They invest uh, a lot of uh, people in every single game and do not seem to make the return on that Mm -hmm. that they need to. And, yeah, it's just kind of led them into this this point where uh, the, uh, I guess the technical company that owns it is the Guillermo Brothers Limited, mm-hmm. is the company run by the family uh, that has founded Ubisoft, sort of runs the uh, the company at this point, mm. um, as they own about twenty percent of the publisher's voting rights, and then holds about nine point two percent. Um, yeah, so yeah, that seems uh, like a weird situation to get into. Mm-hmm. Having a Chinese yeah. company own a French company. Yeah. Very, very odd. So, yeah. Hopefully, the Ubisoft does a bit better, but they've obviously kind of delayed Assassin's Creed mm-hmm. and uh, put more of a focus on improving Star Wars Outlaws for the holiday season. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably have that on sale a decent bit to uh, get people enticed to check it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll see how that goes we'll see I think they just put out a big update pretty recently to uh, address some issues but yeah uh, that kind of stuff just led to me kind of not want to jump into it so so much so Uh, there you go for that that's your Ubisoft news of the week Mm -hmm. Uh, time for some Devolver Digital news as they have announced a new publishing arm called Big Mm -hmm. Fan uh, yeah, which um, big fan games, uh, which is for licensed games, uh, which is a pretty fun name for that kind of initiative. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's uh, uh, their new label, label responsible for publishing game adaptations of movie, TV shows, and comic books. Uh, developer subsidiary Good Shepherd will oversee oversee the nascent publisher. Uh, which they uh, acquired that team, uh, which was the one publishing Hellboy Web of the Weird and John Wick Hex back in 2021. Uh, So yeah, they'll offer their services in finance, PR, marketing, and other key areas to help developers uh, do that. So, and yeah, they have an EA alum, Lincoln Hirschberger, as the GM of this studio, of this uh, team, and uh, Alliance Gates, Lionsgate Games creative director Amanda Cruz is on board as the business management head. So mm. uh, they got some people experienced in licensed games. So certainly like looks pretty, like it. It seems like a pretty solid, yeah, uh, group there. So pretty solid team, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. See if that's going to be a uh, uh, a pretty good uh, team there and bring mm-hmm. some cool games. Especially the way that Devolver tends to do things, maybe find oh, yeah. uh, 
uh, IPs that maybe people weren't thinking would make good, make for good mm-hmm. games, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, um, also speaking of publishing arms, uh, the Vampire Survivors developer Punkle mm-hmm. has opened their own publishing arm to help other indies. Uh, as they say here, it will not operate as a traditional publisher. Mm. Um, yeah, they do not want to take the IP from developers when I operate as a traditional publisher, mm. but work more as a label or fund to enable people to make their games. Mm. And especially you're saying they don't want people to make more Vampire Survivors games. Yeah. So um, they'll offer funding as well as platform support, localization, QA, uh, release management, and development advice for games built with sincerity, passion, and depth. Um, yeah. That is, uh, that is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they also set, outlined their Insta nose, as they call it, which include anything survivor-like, anything AI or Web3 related, and a free-to-play mobile games. Mm. So they don't want any of those. They want nope. cool games. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be uh, interesting to see. I like when uh, indie devs kind of get big enough, they start helping out other devs uh, mm-hmm. get their ideas to life, so... Definitely. Uh, that's cool to see. Uh, but yeah, right. let's get to uh, some more news. California passed a law mm-hmm. uh, that is forcing digital storefronts to label purchases as licenses and not um, things that you will own, essentially. Because that's, I mean, that's the truth, isn't it? Like, yeah, they can basically take it away from you, even if you've already paid them for the product. So... Yeah. That is exactly what it is. Yeah, as they describe it here, the seller provides to the co- the consumer before executing each transaction a clear and conspicuous uh, statement that states in plain language that buying or purchasing the digital good is a license. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, PlayStation, Valve, and Xbox were typically listed as companies that fall under this requirement. Other platform holders, such as Nintendo, Ubisoft, EA, also operate operates in the region mm. i believe the uh the person that was sort of uh pushing this bill uh was calling out like gog is like one of the people that as a result does not really um apply to this law mm-hmm. uh, because they offer you know drm free versions of those games that you can uh download and keep as uh long as you want you know Mm-hmm. Um, you can archive them in your own personal uh, backups and all that, so uh, they don't kind of fall into that, but this seemed like a bit of a response to what Ubisoft had been doing of late, mm. um, especially with the crew, uh, where the game just kind of disappeared and became unplayable Yep, uh, fully because they did not want to keep uh, whatever upkeep costs on the, on the servers and such uh, going, and essentially shut it down so uh that is uh uh an issue that definitely has been going for a while so yeah that seems pretty solid but i don't i don't know how much any of these companies really have to change Mm. uh, the way they're doing business uh, business with this stuff yeah Uh, just maybe make that a little more abundantly clear but you know that kind of stuff is already mentioned in like their terms of service and whatnot that Mm-hmm. Should at least glance through uh, versus just skipping them. Yeah. Um, nice to at least be aware of some of the basic things in there. You don't have to read the whole thing, obviously. But yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's something good. Mm. Uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, something bad here. Well, bad for Google and Samsung. Uh, they are the subjects of a new Epic Games lawsuit. Mm hmm. Um, because they have had to open up their uh, OSs to accommodate third-party storefronts. Yep. And as Epic has sort of uh, offered their Epic Game Store, mobile store kind of thing, um, the way that you go about doing that on uh, Android and the version of Android that Samsung has created essentially make that a huge pain in the ass in a way that they're claiming is an anti-competitive practice, essentially. Yeah. Uh, which the Google one seems fairly uh, straightforward for the most part. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see. 
Uh, I'm trying to see where. Yeah, you get told that there are settings uh, you have to change to allow external unapproved APK files to install, and then go digging for them before then being warned how dangerous it all is. Mm. Uh, with Samsung, um, I guess the, the person who wrote this article particularly had an issue with that because uh, their son likes to play Fortnites and wants to play it on their tablet, their Samsung tablet. And this um, person went through that whole process mm. and details it here. Um, uh, so yeah, let me see where he lays it out here. Uh, uh, Epic has laid out how to disable auto blocker on its website, which is what Samsung has. Mm. Um, adding a flight of extra steps to the process of installing unapproved apps. Uh, as he found out in a coffee shop after thinking to be able to surprise his son with Fortnite on his tablet when he'd left to switch at home. Um, you only learn that you need to do this after Samsung throws up a message saying it won't install the EGS. Mm. Uh, the traditional link to the section of the device settings to change it. Uh, in his situation, he was then using the Samsung infected version of the Android settings menu uh, to search for the option, a feature that's usually useful, and it acted as though it didn't exist. Mm. End up having to separately Google the process and then do battle with an extra layer of complication. Google family links protections that prevent his son from installing things without his permission, which in this particular case forced him to go deep into uh, family link settings on his own device to find the things to disable, by which point he was already annoying his kid uh, whose tablet he'd taken away. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, what's in all this for Google and Samsung? Well, the reason Epic kicked off in the first place was of Google's claimed anti-competitive practice of forcing all third-party developers uh, to provide or sell their apps through Google Play, which resulted in 30% of your transaction fees going to Google. Mm-hmm. And Epic and others uh, thought about uh, there should be ways to avoid that if you can. And yeah, they were doing that, but... Uh, seems like it's still not maybe as easy as it should be. Yeah. Um, and yeah, saying, uh, they say in this autoblocker conducts no assessment of the safety or security of any specific source or any specific app for blocking an installation. Um, saying that it's not designed to protect against malware to be a completely legitimate purpose, but designed to prevent competition. Mm. Um, yeah, it seems like a thing that you do because you just want to they're like, well, you're on your own if you do this, and we're not going to make that easy to disable. You know, it's literally been a part of the Android ecosystem since it started to be an open source yeah. thing. Where you could you know, install your own launchers and whatnot on versions yeah. of Android um, to be like this uh, combative to the process of doing this seems. Uh, like you're fighting against the the very small cases of, uh, say, normies that are uh, potentially download random things mm-hmm. to their detriment, which would be a very small case amount of cases versus the people that know what they're doing just wanting to uh, have other options. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, that seems like a, a legit thing to at least take to the courts and see... Uh, what the what the judge and jury has to say there? Yeah, the idea of these fall under the jurisdiction of anti-competitive practice, but there's one way to find out. So mm-hmm. there you go. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that? No, that sounds about pretty much sums it up pretty well. Um, yeah, um, and I think, you know, obviously Google and Samsung, I think to a certain extent, they intentionally make it clunky like that because they want to be able to sort of monopolize what apps go into their, you know, ser- their system or whatever. But yeah. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much sums it up pretty well, I think. All right. Uh, let's get to the dumbest story of the week. Oh, yes, of course, because it can't, we can't have us have a, we can't go one week without some stupid culture war bullshit. Yeah, uh, Dragon Quest Three HD 2D remake has uh, been a uh, highly anticipated game here mm-hmm. um, amongst many of our people. 
Uh, and going through TGS, you know, they had a, an opportunity for Square Enix to uh, promote this game and all that. So they have been uh, doing some of that, had some interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one particular one has really uh, kicked the, the hornet's nest of uh, yeah. the culture war that's been going on. Uh, There's anti-woke uh, things involving... You know, Elon Musk and uh, all these kind of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, this involved an interview which Yuji Hori and um, I forget if there was another producer on the game uh, was also with him. Uh, no, this was former editor-in-chief of Weekly Shonen Jump, Kazuhiko Torishima. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was part of a stream hosted by DJ Nas Chris, uh, who was in Dragon Quest Three cosplay for some reason. Um, but this was separate from the official on-stage panel discussion for the game. Uh, mm. RPG sites helped uh, do some um, localization for this to help people understand what's being said. Um, and yeah, they talked about uh, different little topics, uh, particularly the way they changed the gender toy and gender choice from male and female to type A and type B. Mm-hmm. I don't know was a necessary thing, but mm. um, that's triggered these people, especially. Yeah. Um, they've also tweaked the art for the female warrior location, yeah. uh, which, seeing what the original art was, it's literally uh, bikini armor. Yeah. Which is like, yeah, that's very dumb. Yeah. Um, and so their, their change to it is to literally have almost like skin colored uh, top under the bikini uh, Mm -hmm. and uh, shorts under the bikini uh, parts as well, which in the, if you look at the uh, sprite art, it's basically hard to see at all there. So it seems for only for this um, or concept art version of that, which I don't think you're going to, I don't know if you're going to see that very much, but it triggers these people because of the, the supposed censorship. Mm-hmm. I think even to the point of people being like, well, there was no censorship in the 80s and 90s for Japanese games. And it's like, boy, that's... Uh... They literally completely redid the, the like, it wasn't even called Dragon Quest over here. It was called Dragon Warrior. And they yeah. basically, like, completely rewrote the whole thing top to bottom. Yeah. They had to because Nintendo of America's, you know policy at the time was that any kind of religious iconography had to be completely taken out and the OG Dragon Quest games were loaded with it. Yeah. And it's like that's brought up as a a thing here. Um yeah. So it conflates it kind of sloppily in a way that makes this seem like it's a modern thing, but uh Nas Chris says she doesn't understand the need for the changes. Um, according to RPG site's translation of the exchange, and Hori appears to agree. Hiroshima then starts to talk about content ratings abroad and the difficulties of getting stuff approved in the U.S. Mm. It really came from the West, a way of approaching a sex education with a religious concept exists, exists in America, doesn't it? Um, their way of thinking on compliance is really very narrow. And so this ended up being a mistranslation, uh, the sex education thing was uh, supposed to be Puritan. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the scene where he mentioned Puritan, it was mistakenly translated as sex education. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously this is not going to matter to any of these people mm-hmm. because they have videos with English text over it or screenshots of this bit that's going to be used as you know pure proof of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he goes on to say you can choose a male or female version of the protagonist. We cannot write it as choose from male or female. It became type one and two. Yeah, it says according to RPG site, I wonder who the heck are going to complain about male and female. I don't understand. Uh, to be clear here, Yuji Hori is a seventy-year-old man. Yeah, so seventy-year-old Japanese man who would not necessarily uh, be fully update on gender norms in 2024. Yeah. Uh, especially in the West where that's become a much bigger thing uh, than in Japan. Yeah. Uh, 
where it's starting to become a more accepted thing, but it's not as uh, big as it is here. He just comes off as a grouchy old man here um, about this stuff. And then again, I don't know that you necessarily needed to take out male and female, but I guess if they are making changes, like that's a minor thing. But then uh, this video uh, featuring this stuff uh, gets quote retweeted by Elon Musk saying this is insane. Because of course, of course. Yeah, who as a this this is a actor described here, who has become like a moth to the flame for anti woke engagement baits. Um, it's unclear which part specifically he was referring referencing, but it helped the soundbite break containment. Who other statesmen of manga and video games, both Torishima and Hori are in their seventies, seem to be vindicating the quiet outrage on certain forums and YouTube channels about the Dragon Quest three cuts and a broader conspiracy about quiet censorship. Of Japanese game, Japanese games and entertainment. So far, all of this is predictable as the sun. What happens when that? Uh, what happened next? That got weird. And as Chris, the original interviewer, posted on October second, accusing the clips of mistranslating part of the conversation and taking it out of context. Yeah. Uh, Valute News, one of the ex accounts that originally shared translated remarks of the footage, deleted the post and apologized. Uh, yeah, by saying, uh, "I was, I would like to sincerely apologize for the incorrect." English subtitles created for Mr. Kazuhiko Torishima's statement yeah. and the stuff I mentioned earlier. So uh, the Twitter account for the radio program, Hori and uh, Torishima host together, also responded, putting out a statement calling on people to stop spreading clip parts of the conversation, suggesting the content had been mistranslated, misconstrued. Yeah. Uh, substance of the dispute seemed to hinge on the use of sex education instead of Puritan. Yeah. It's unclear what meaningful difference that would have made to the overall meeting, however, especially Ori's remark about the remake changing the gender labels. Mm-hmm. But for the uh, anti woke gaming conspiracies, this reaction is the best of both worlds. The initial conversation seems to validate the original criticisms of the changes, while mm-hmm. the apparent damage control efforts after their marks escaped into the wider, wider inter- internet are not being treated like some sort of evidence of some kind of cover up. Yeah. And of course, Square Enix is nowhere to put out a statement on this mm-hmm. and just kind of fans this flame. Yeah. Of here. So that's how Dragon Quest 3 HD 2D remake became part of the culture war <sighs> in a very dumb way. Mm-hmm. Because again, games have been getting censored in localization for as long yeah. as they've been coming over to the West. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pac Man was not called Pac Man in Japan. It was no. Paku Man. Yeah. They changed it because, well, the the way that we heard it was they didn't want people to be able to change it to Fuck Man. Mm-hmm. Um, but they probably changed it because Pac Man uh doesn't need much translation as a name as mm-hmm. a Paku Man or Paku Man. Yeah. Uh, so they just kind of simplified things at a certain point. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's been lots of uh, changes of translations over the years. Dragon Quest, yeah, was Dragon Warrior, because there was already something named Dragon Quest here at that point. That I don't know if it was in the game realm where they really needed to pay heed to that, but it took them until uh, probably what eight that they yeah. just went with Dragon Quest. Yeah, it was seven or eight. I forget. I think it was. Eight. It was eight. Um. Which would have been like 2004, 2005, that they like, hey, we should start calling this Dragon War, uh, Dragon Quest again. Mm. So they figured that out. So yeah. So yeah, there you go. There's your bullshit of the week. Yeah, no kidding. Good lord. If only they hadn't designed this female warrior back in the 80s as uh, a very sexist trope of uh, only needing very little armor compared to her male compatriot. I mean, that was literally all of fantasy art in the 80s. Like, that yeah. isn't unique to them like, no, at all. They could have been better. They could have, so. but it was also the 80s. Like, I just, it's, it was the 80s, it was the 90s, it, it is. What... Yeah, but. It's the time period, you just kind of have to learn to accept it. Yeah, unfortunately, they've owned themselves and pushed their, their product into this stupid zone. Mm-hmm. 40 years later. So 
Yeah. That's where we're at, but uh, yeah, I think that is going to do it for the show this week, unless you have anything to add. Mm-hmm. Nope. I'm uh, good. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that'll be it for the show. Uh, we'll mm-hmm. be back with uh, some new news next week, hopefully some new games to talk about and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you to Brandon for joining this week. Always. Uh, let me check out what we got coming out here this week. This loads. There we go. Uh, let me see. There we go. September, October. All right. And this week we have, uh, let's see. There's Kind Words 2 on PC. Mm-hmm. Uh, Diablo 4's expansion, Vessel of Hatred's out this week. Yep. Uh, Silent Hill 2, the remake, is out this week, which seems mm-hmm. to be pretty good. Yep. Uh, in spite of what Silent Hill fans wanted it to turn out to be. Yeah. Uh, to the Moon's out this week. We talked about that last week. That's one people should check out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bloodless is out this week on Switch. On the, the 10th, let's see. Oh, yeah, UFO Robot Grandizer, The Feast of the Wolves is out on the Switch. Yep. If you like your old robot anime. Yep. And that's old robot anime. That's like 70s robot anime. Yeah. Uh, let's see. On the 11th, Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. Is finally out. Uh, Europa is also out. Uh, Metaphor and Fantasio. Uh, the Starship Troopers extermination mm-hmm. game. Uh, yep. Transformers Galactic Trials. Mm-hmm. Somehow made a new one. Uh, Undisputed. That's the boxing game, the independently made boxing game. Mm. Uh, that seems to be largely it. So, some decent stuff. Atlas mm-hmm. got their big game out this week. So, I'm sure you're getting that, Brandon. Yep. All right. We'll hear more about that next week. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, if you enjoy the show, for let friends and family know and select strangers that are also excited for uh, met- uh, Metaphor Refantasia. Yeah. Which is a lot of people, apparently. I mean, yeah. it is more or less a spiritual companion to the Persona series. So, it's it's getting a lot of hype. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that'll be out. And yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Hope you have a good week ahead. We'll see you all next time. Have a good one.